Hi there, my name is Michelle Williams from Edinburgh in Scotland and I'm going to talk today about coronary CTA looking at the coronary artery disease, the stents and the grafts. So our learning outcomes for today, we're going to look at how to identify and report coronary artery disease, how to be able to identify coronary artery stents and understand how these influence the appearances that you see on CTCA and also how to be able to identify and report coronary artery bypass grafts. So let's start with coronary artery disease. So coronary artery disease is a very complicated process. It starts off with lipid within the coronary arteries and there's a process of inflammation, there's lots of different cells appearing and we've got smooth muscle changes and we end up with this necrotic lipid core. And the thin cap fiber atheroma is this high risk plaque that we'll see, but there's a whole bunch of things that come along from calcified plaque, non-calcified plaque and everything in between. Obviously CT can't see in this greater detail, um, but we can see a lot of markers of these different things. And coronary artery disease is part of a cyclic process. It, it's an ongoing, constantly um, changing pattern in each coronary artery. We have stable plaques, we have unstable plaques, we have myocardial infarction, either uh, seen or, or not seen clinically, and we've got this constantly changing thing. So the plaque that you see one day or one week or one year may be different to the plaque that you see in the same place at a different point in time. So we're interested in this because cardiovascular disease is very common and 7.3 million deaths per year worldwide are caused by coronary heart disease in particular. So when we're identifying coronary artery disease on CT, what are we going to do? Well, we can split it in to a few different sections and I'll go through these. So we want to know what we're seeing, where it is, how bad it is, how sure you are of what you're saying, are there other things that you need to comment on, and then we want some form of summary statement at the end of the report. So if you want to know anything about reporting CT, this is the guidelines to look at and read. It's got all of the details in there, and um, it's not a long document and it's not a difficult document to read, and it tells you everything you need to know. So let's start with what. Atherosclerotic plaque takes lots of different forms and the main ones that we can see on CT are the calcified plaque, the non-calcified plaque and the mixed plaque. So this coronary artery here in this curved planar reformation has several different types of plaque that you're able to see nicely. The bright white ones are the calcified plaque and they're often easy to see, bright white. The level of density of calcification can vary and small calcified plaques can be only just above the attenuation of your lumen of contrast. So you've got to make careful use of your windowing to be able to see small calcified plaques. The big ones are often very easy to see and cause us problems as we'll talk about later on. Then we've got the non-calcified plaque, which is the dark part of the wall that you can see with, excuse me, that you can see with um, carefully looking at the coronary arteries. It's important not to miss this as this is the potentially most risky plaque. And then you've got mixed plaques and most plaques are actually mixed plaques, part calcified, part non-calcified. So here's a zoomed in view with the calcification, a small spot of calcification that's only just above the attenuation of the lumen. And then we've got the non-calcified plaque around it. The next thing is where. So the anatomy lecture that I gave previously went into a lot of detail about how to identify different segments of the coronary arteries. And this is the a graphic from the SCCT document that shows you how each of these are named. So where, we'll not go into in much detail because we've already dealt with this, and if in doubt, refer back to this document. The next thing is how bad is this? The stenosis severity. 
And this is something that um, we spend a lot of time thinking about. These are the ways of splitting up stenosis severity um, from the SCCT guidelines. You will see other people using different ways of splitting up the stenosis, but these are the recommended ones. And you can see that we've got a um, word for the grade, um, to a descriptive word, um, a diameter of stenosis in numerical terms, and an interpretation about what that means. Now the diameter stenosis, we're not measuring this, we're visually assessing this. And these are ranges rather than precise numbers because that's what CT allows us to do. It doesn't really allow us on a routine clinical practice basis to get precise numbers, but we can split the stenosis into these different groups. So first of all, we've got normal, no plaque, minimal, less than 25% stenosis, and this has minimal impact on the coronary artery lumen. Then we have mild, 25 to 49%, moderate, 50 to 69%, and this is when possible flow limiting disease starts to come in. And then severe, 70 to 99%, which are the ones we're really interested in. And then we have occluded vessels, no flow. Now it can be very difficult to see total occlusion and subtotal occlusion and differentiate them on CT because if you've got the, even the tiniest bit of contrast getting through, you might not see that. So total or subtotal occlusion um, um, are different, difficult to differentiate, but we know that they're definitely in the severe spectrum. So let's have a look at some examples of this. So first of all, this is a curved planar reformation, the LED, and this is normal. This next one, we've got two plaques. You can see them on the coronary artery calcium score, and you can also see them on the CT angiogram. So the first plaque, you can see on the calcium score, there's a bit of calcified plaque there. On the angiogram, it's just causing a very small indent into the lumen just here. So this one we're going to call minimal, less than 25% stenosis. And that's just at the bifurcation of the left main stem into the LED. The second plaque here is in the LED proper, and we've got a small calcified plaque that you can see on your calcium score. And then on the CT angiogram, you can see it's slightly bigger than the first plaque we were looking at, but it's still not causing much problem in the actual coronary artery lumen. So this one we'll call mild less than 50% stenosis. Here again, we have several plaques. The one that's got the arrow, we've got a large lump of calcification, but most of that is externally remodeling and it's not actually impacting the lumen particularly badly. So we'll call that one mild, less than 50%. Further down the LED, we have another calcified plaque which again is mild, less than 50% stenosis. The eagle-eyed of you will have seen that there's a few other plaques here. We've got one more proximally, just into the left main stem here, both calcified and non-calcified plaque. And we'd call this one minor, less than 25% stenosis, as it's barely impacting the lumen. Further down, we've got two more plaques, again minor, and then the distal vessel looks all right. So increasing in severity here, now we've got a moderate plaque. Um, so this is in the LED, and you can see it on the curved planar reformation just behind that pulmonary artery. And then, sorry, on the 3D reconstruction. And then on the curved planar reformation, we've got two views which are at 90 degrees to each other. And you can see that there's a lot of calcification here. Now calcification is a problem. Calcium always looks bigger than it actually is, and that's due to a number of different reasons. You can have partial volume averaging, blooming artifact, and motion artifact, as we've got in this case, just a little bit of motion artifact, all make the calcium worse. So calcium looks bigger than it actually is on our CT scans. So we've always got to try and account for that when we're thinking about how bad a stenosis is going to be but we can't say what we don't see. 
if we do see a little bit of a lumen going past the coronary artery, then it's probably 50%. But in this case, it becomes very difficult to be certain that there's definitely a lumen going through this. We can't be sure that there's definitely obstructive disease, but we know it's probably more than just mild disease. So we're going to call this one moderate, 50 to 70% stenosis. And these are interesting um, ones when it comes to assessing stenosis. We know that we're very good diagnostic accuracy and observer variability point of view for identifying the less than 25% and the 50% plaques. And similarly, occluded vessels, we are very good at. 70%, we're pretty good at, but the 50 to 70% is where most of the problems come as to whether this is flow limiting obstructive disease or not. So if we see a moderate 50 to 70% stenosis, we do have to think carefully about the clinical implications of that on a per patient basis. So moving up in severity, we're now going on to the severe, greater than 70% stenosis. So this um, plaque, sorry, this vessel has a number of plaques all the way down this coronary artery. Now the arrowed one, you can see there's a combination of calcified and non-calcified plaque, and the lumen becomes very narrow at that point. So we've got severe, greater than 70% stenosis. But there's also a number of other plaques in this right coronary artery, ranging from mild to moderate, all the way up to severe. And for this sort of patient, we're going to describe them on a per segment basis and then highlight any particularly um, bad plaques that the clinicians need to be aware of. So in the proximal section, we've got calcified and non-calcified plaque that's causing mild stenosis, less than 50%. In the mid vessel, we've got severe mixed plaque causing greater than 70% stenosis. And then in that distal vessel, as it curves around uh, the base of the heart, we've got these two plaques. And that's a long segment of non calcified and calcified plaque that becomes very narrow at this point here. So this is another severe stenosis. And I would be highlighting that this is a long segment of calcified and non-calcified plaque in the distal vessel causing moderate to severe stenosis and at one point severe stenosis greater than 70%. And you can see here on our invasive coronary angiography comparison that the bit we're most interested in was this middle bit that causes that severe stenosis, but there are these other ones further down that are also bad. But look at that proximal vessel, that calcified blob, look big, much bigger than its impact on the um, coronary artery lumen, particularly at that point, due to the problems of calcium blooming artifact. So this is another example of severe, greater than 70% stenosis in at least two places in this vessel. So our proximal vessel is normal, but just here we've got calcified and non-calcified plaque causing quite a severe stenosis, greater than 70%. This section is normal, but here again, we've got um, um, mild disease, so calcified plaque causing mild stenosis. You have to be very careful when things go around coroners to try and take that into account. And then this part here is a very severe stenosis with calcified and non-calcified plaque. And then in the distal vessel, we've got minor calcified plaque. This one is an example of an occluded vessel, and you get the first hint of this on the 3D reconstructions. Now, 3D reconstructions are only as good as the image quality and the software that you're using, and you shouldn't be using them for uh, actually making diagnoses, but they're very interesting from the point of view of giving you an overall overview, particularly in cases where there's um, interesting or unusual coronary artery branching patterns or anomalies or other congenital uh, things going on to try and get in, into your head the general picture of what you're going to be dealing with. They can also show lumps of calcification quite nicely and in this case you can see that the right coronary artery goes down, there's several lumps of calcification and then just no uh, coronary artery from that point of view. And you can see similarly on the curved planar reformation, again, two views at 90 degrees to each other with our um, multifocal calcified and mixed plaque causing severe stenosis. And it, from this point down, uh, from that blue line down the way, that's an occluded vessel. There's no contrast in there. 
And this is also an occluded vessel. So you can see the difference with this one. This is very subtle. Um, and I can tell you that this is definitely not an artifact. Um, stair step artifacts can often be mistaken for occluded vessels unless you look at your um, raw data carefully. Um, but this curved planar reformation, I have um, uh, perfusion data to confirm this and uh, subsequent invasive coronary angiography to confirm it as well. So this is definitely an occluded vessel. But look how small it is and how easy that would be to miss if you're just looking quickly through an axial data set. This is the sort of plaque that really using your curved planar reformations or other NPR reformations helps to identify and not miss. So this is an occluded vessel. There's contrast in the vessel distal to it, but I know that this is definitely occluded. That contrast is coming from collateral vessels round from the other side of the heart. Now, on CT scan, it's really nice because you can follow the tiny, tiny little vessels all the way around and work out where cal um, your collateral vessels are appearing and coming from. But with CT, we do have to remember that we're dealing with a one-off snapshot image at one time point in the cardiac cycle. So working out where that blood flow is coming from is not possible because we don't know whether it's coming from the proximal vessel or from distal collaterals but we can say that it's an occluded vessel and that there are collaterals. We just have to be careful about trying to make conclusions about flow through a vessel per se. So this is a nice summary of all of the different stenoses type that we've talked about. So we've got less than 25%, less than 50%, 50 to 70% and greater than 70%. Anything in the first three categories, we consider non-obstructive and the greater than 70% in the occluded and the occluded vessels, we consider obstructive. So those are two sort of summary terms that we can think about, non-obstructive disease and obstructive disease with the um, understanding that that 50 to 70% group, it may be 50%, it may be 70%, and that's the group that we have to um, highlight and be careful with potentially. So, how sure are you next? So, how sure are you? Diagnostic accuracy of CT angiography is very good. So this is from the meta-analysis done as part of the NICE guidelines, and they looked at diagnostic accuracy compared to invasive coronary angiography at two different thresholds, 50% uh, and 70%. <clears throat> And you can see that CT performs very well. Up at the top of the list, better than the other modalities that they compared it to. And CT does particularly well at identifying um, um, normal coronary arteries. So it has a fantastic uh, sensitivity and a fantastic negative predictive value. Um, if you've got a normal CT scan, you're likely to have normal coronary arteries with great confidence. The specificity does drop off a bit and that's largely due to calcification, heavily calcified plaque where calcium blooming is causing us a problem and our diagnostic accuracy is not quite as good or when there's motion artifacts and even with the best scanners at the moment there's still sometimes motion artifact so that's why there's a drop off in that specificity. So when you're thinking about um, how sure are you, you should think about the image quality of the scan and the type of plaques that you've seen and their severity. So here's an example of two 50 to 70 percent lesions and corresponding invasive coronary angiography. And you can see that the non-calcified plaque at the bottom, we were right, 50 to 70 percent. But the calcified plaque at the top that looks much worse actually is causing practically no impact on that lumen there at all. And that's because the calcium is looking bigger than it is. So a 50 to 70% lesion that's mostly non-calcified, we can be quite certain about. But a 50 to 70% lesion that's very calcified, we are always going to be slightly less certain about. So let's move on to anything else. So 
The first additional thing that you're going to want to comment on is, is there any vulnerable plaque? So this has been um, increasingly in the literature over the past few years. And um, we've realized that we're not just able to tell about how narrow the blood vessels are. What we can tell about the actual vessel wall itself is very useful. So com in comparison to intravascular ultrasound data identifying the thin cap fibroatheroma, we've been able to work out what CT features correspond to that. So in the past, when we were looking at these things, we'd say that looks like a nasty plaque. And now we've actually got verified ways of identifying these nasty plaques with some actual decent definitions. So first of all, positive remodeling. And this is one of the really important ones, I think. So positive remodeling is when that outer vessel wall is building up with plaque and instead of narrowing the lumen, the lumen's expanding out. So this is the Glagov remodeling that's been talked about for a long time. And, and with CT scan, we can really see that. You compare the vessel segment you're interested in to either a proximal or distal reference segment, ideally proximal, but whatever is the best that you've got. And you can see that positive remodeling, you've got more plaque on the outside. The next one that's really important is the low density plaque. And we think that this corresponds with the necrotic core that we see in the thin cap fibroatheroma on IVIS. So less than 30 Heinzfeld units is a good cutoff to use, less than um, to identify the fat. But you've also got um, a variety of different cutoffs that you could use. So different um, people in different softwares use different cutoffs. Then you've got spotty calcification, that little dot of calcification. A few different thoughts as to what this is. A little bit of calcification forming in that nidus of necrotic core could be one. And then you've got the napkin ring sign. Now the napkin ring sign is kind of a combination of your positive remodeling and low attenuation plaque. So you've got your positive remodeling which is the rim of lighter stuff around the edge. And then you've got your low attenuation plaque in the middle bit. Um, and they're not that common to see, and you really have to look at the vessel in that transaxial way to be able to identify them for certain. Um, on curved planar reformations, it's sometimes possible to see, but really looking at them on a, an axial view straight down the coronary artery helps being able to identify them. So these are our three features of the vulnerable plaques and different research studies have used different combinations of them um, and shown that these are predictive of long-term outcome. But the thing we do have to remember is that these are constantly remodeling and constantly changing. So if you see a vulnerable plaque one year, it might not be there the next year. And um, so we do have to think about that as well. The next thing that we can say about our coronary arteries is, is there a stent there? Now, I have to say that the easiest way to work out if there's a stent there is to be given the clinical history. So knowing that this patient has had an LED stent or a, a RCA stent really makes this a lot easier. When you're looking at stents and you're looking at CT scans, some of these stents can be really difficult to differentiate from just bad calcification, particularly if you've got um, lots of calcified vessels all over the place. And this, um, this uh, picture shows that there's quite a range of different appearances that stents can have. So a lot of older stents are very, very dense, whereas more modern stents, particularly with low density metals, are much more difficult to see. Now, a couple of hints for working out whether there is a stent present. Well, stents are very uniform in their shape. You've got this tram track appearance of a line of calcification down either side. So looking at the coronary artery on a curved plane of reformation can really help you see these. Another tip is that um, you should have, um, in the less dense sense, uniform dots of the struts going down the coronary artery. That can be easier to see in some stents than others, and it very much depends on the material they're made of. 
Also, you can adjust your window settings so that you can see the stents a bit better. So if you have your window settings um, um, set at their standard CT coronary angiography level, it might look very bright. But if you're trying to look at a dense calcification or dense metal, if you adjust your window settings, you'll be able to see that you're able to um, reduce the amount of brightness that's causing that stent. So that's a second tip for dealing with stents. The third tip for dealing with stents is to think about what reconstruction you're using to actually look at the scan. So your standard um, CT coronary angiography reconstruction is set up to be able to see the coronary arteries and different types of atherosclerotic plaque. But if you have a slightly sharper reconstruction, that can reduce the amount of calcium blooming that you might have, and you're potentially going to be able to see that lumen a bit better. So that's three tips for how to deal with stents. But the top tip is try and find out the history because that does make it a lot easier. So let's have a look at a few stents. So this first example is a patent stent. So you can see we've got two curved planar reformations at 90 degrees to each other. And then we've got some views looking straight down the coronary arteries. So this is a stent that's in the proximal LED. And we can see a nice column of contrast going all the way down through that vessel. We've got a few calcified plaques distally causing mild stenosis, but this is a patent stent with background non-obstructive disease. Now on those views looking down the coronary arteries, you can start to see some brighter dots around the vessel and these are the struts that are making up the stents. So this second example is right at the other end of the spectrum. This is an occluded stent. So this again is a um, vessel with two carplanar reformations at 90 degrees to each other and you can see that this vessel actually has multiple stents. This is actually three different stents. And you can see that at some points there's a more dense area and that's where the stents are overlapping. So this proximal stent we can see quite nicely and we can see that col column of uh, contrast within it. We can then see the overlap of the two stents. This second stent is a bit more difficult to see. Um, we can't really be 100% sure what's going on, particularly in this middle segment. It looks underdeployed and it doesn't look that happy. This is again where the stents overlap at this point, and then we have a distal stent, which you can see several blobs of quite dark material within it. So particularly on this one, we can see this is all dark, dark, dark. It gets a bit lighter here and then another dark blob. So this is either instant restenosis or thrombus. Uh, you can never be 100% sure on CD, which you're seeing. Um, but we've definitely got a lot of it here and then another large blob here. The distal vessel has a very small amount of contrast in it that could be just trickling through the vessel or coming from collaterals. In this case, the likelihood is with the appearance of that stent that that's coming from collaterals and that was confirmed on invasive coronary angiography. So, Proximal patent stent, slightly suspicious, probably underdeployed middle stent, and then an occluded distal stent. So how sure can we be of the appearances of stents? Well, there's a few meta-analyses that have been done looking at the diagnostic accuracy of CT coronary angiography for identifying instant restenosis. Now, Coronary artery stents um, have varied in their density and makeup over time. So potentially older studies may not be the best for um, telling us how good it is at looking at modern stents. And CT scanner technology also does change with reconstruction algorithms that are better for metal having been uh, developed. So when we're Combining all the studies together, we do have to think about, well, what type of stent does my patient have and what sort of scanner do I have? 
Overall, the pool's sensitivity is about 86% and specificity about 93%. So not bad. Again, if the stent is patent, we're very good at seeing that. If a stent is definitely occluded, we're probably going to be quite good at seeing that. It's the stents in the middle that can cause us some problems. Okay, so let's move on to coronary artery bypass grafts. So coronary artery bypass grafts, people often um, get very upset and worried about it and think this is going to take me ages to report. I've got a few tips for how best to identify coronary artery bypass grafts, and it boils down to two things. One, being systematic in how you assess them, and two, having some knowledge of what sort of surgery is either done in your center or the patient has had. If you've got the history of the patient and you know exactly what um, the surgeon has done, then that really does help. Although a word of warning, the vessel that the surgeons have attached the distal grafts to is not always what they've actually think they've done is what you'll see on the CT scan. Um, and that's because when you're doing a coronary artery bypass graft, there's a time pressure and a visual pressure and a lot of stuff going on and a lot of blood in the way. And you might think you've attached it to an LED or a diagonal and it might be the other way around, or you might think you've just attached it to the obtuse marginal and it's actually a diagonal. So uh, particularly if it's been a long and complicated surgery, be aware that um, what you're seeing may be more correct than the surgical note on occasions. Um, so obviously lima grafts and SVG grafts are the commonest ones you're going to see. Sometimes you're going to see skip grafts, particularly if um, uh, you've got um, uh, patients that were operated on or multiple times or at previous times. And other things you might see are any blood vessel attaching to any blood vessel. Um, there's, we, the, we've had a few cases of people coming from abroad with uh, different practices that we're used to, and then we have to start from scratch working out where the vessels are going. So this first diagram shows you a nice um, lima graft. So coming from the lima, uh, origin all the way down attaching to the LED or a diagonal. The second one has both lima and SVG grafts. This third one has a lima and then a skip graft and then an SVG and this third one has lima, extra graft, two SVG grafts and you may or may not see any variant of these and they may or may not be patent. The good news is that CTE is actually quite good at um, assessing and analyzing bypass grafts. There's two reasons for that. One, they're often quite large. We're used to dealing with tiny uh, distal branches of coronary arteries, whereas coronary artery bypass grafts um, are much larger blood vessels to start with. The second thing is that there's less in the way of motion artifact. So motion artifact of the heart causes us lots of problems when we're assessing our CT coronary angiograms. But when it comes to the coronary artery bypass grafts, most of them are not moving as much, particularly if the patient has a good breath hold. Your distal vessels and your anastomosis are still going to move at the same rate as any other coronary artery because that's what you're looking at. But most of the rest should be free of most motion artifacts. So some tips for being systematic with the graphs. So this is what I do when I'm looking at graphs, and this really helps in not missing a graft. So on every CT scan that I'm looking at graphs, I'm gonna start in the same way. I'm gonna look at the lima. I'm gonna start from looking at the origin of the lima and work my way all the way down the lima to work out where it's going. Then I'm going to look at the rima. Is it in its normal place or has it been used for a graft? And then I'm going to start at the arch of the aorta and work my way down the anterior aspect of the aorta, looking for other grafts that have been attached to it. Now, one word of warning, you do have to be careful if someone's had an on-pump coronary artery bypass graft, they can put a very large um, catheter right into the center of the aorta. And that can, um, it doesn't always uh, heal up 
totally flat and it can look like a little bit of a bulge out anteriorly and I have seen that mistaken for an SVG graft that's occluded and um, you won't if it is um, an SVG graft you'll see other evidence that it exists um, if it um, is just from where they put a big catheter in, you'll see just the lump and nothing else. But you, you want to work your way down the anterior of the aorta and every time you see a graft appearing, work your way all the way down it and look at it. You're wanting on each graft to look at where it starts, where it goes to, are there any narrowings within it or any aneurysmal segments? And then how good is the anastomosis? And how good is the contrast in the distal vessel? Now, distal runoff, you've got to be careful because we're not being able to tell on the CT scan that there is flow. We can just say that there is contrast in the distal vessel. We can't say that there's specifically runoff or that there's flow of contrast in the distal vessel. But we can use the words, there is contrast in the distal vessel. And if you have no history of the patient and you don't know that there are graphs, there are a few things that might give you a hint that there are graphs and you really should be looking for them. Is, is there a midline stenotomy? Are you seeing epicardial pacing leads? Is there another surgery going on like valvular heart disease? Or are you seeing any of the complications of surgery? So these can all give you hints that there are coronary artery bypass grafts and if you haven't been given that history, trigger you to look for them. So anytime I see a midline stenotomy, I look for the lemma, I look for the rema, and I look for whether there are any SVG graphs, just in case there's something people haven't told me. Okay, let's have a look at some graphs. First of all, let's have a look at the lemma and the rema where they normally are. So these should be small arterial vessels that you see tucked in behind the chest wall. And if you start looking at them on your normal CT coronary angiograms, you will see that uh, you'll get the idea of where they are normally. And this is a lemma graft that's been um, imaged on this CT coronary angiogram. So we've got a 3D reconstruction, we've got a curved planar reformation, and then an axial view. Now, 3D reconstructions can be really useful to see the graphs and work out where they're going. The one thing is you need to make sure that your software is selecting out those graphs and sometimes you have to help give it a bit of a help manually. So you'll see on the 3D reconstruction, I've selected out the lima, which is this vessel going all the way down the front here. But they also have some SVG graphs. We've got an SVG graph going around here to LAD or a diagonal and another one going down around here to a distal RCA or PDA. And you can see that the RCA itself not really much vessel that's there, uh, just a little bit of calcium, so it looks uh, quite badly diseased. So on the curved planar reformation, again, you can see the lima all the way down here, um, selected out nicely. Um, so the first thing we want to do with this graft is to actually look at its origin, and I haven't given you pictures of that, but we want to confirm that the origin looks good and that there's no narrowing. We've then got the lima graft coming down and we want to confirm that that column of contrast looks good all the way down and that there's no stenosis. And then we want to look very carefully at the anastomosis, which is this part here. This is the distal vessel, that is the proximal vessel, and this is the graft coming in. Now working out exactly where the anastomosis is and how it looks is, does take a little bit of practice because you want to ensure that it's um, joining in nicely and that there's no obvious um, stenosis at that point or immediately distally. And you want to look all the way around it to be sure. Now on axial images, sometimes people find it a little bit difficult to follow where the lemma is and where it's going. One top tip is to look out for the surgical clips. So a lemma graft has surgical clips all the way down clipping off the little branch vessels. So if you've got a lima graph that's um, occluded and there's no contrast in it anymore, but you're trying to work out where it went before, you're looking at all these little dots, bright dots of calcification. So that's a lima graft. 
let's have a wee look at some SVG graphs. So in this case, we've got another Lima graph and we've got two SVG graphs, both going to, that's probably going to an OM circumflex and this one looks like it's going to diagonal with the Lima going to the LED here. And they can attach to any branch, so you do need to look quite carefully. So this is an SVG graph. This is arch of the aorta, SVG graph coming off the anterior of the aorta, Contrast looks okay here, but then all of a sudden, not good. All of this black splodge is an occluded SVG graft. And the reason that there's these bright white bits either side is this is a stented SVG graft that's then occluded. So there was problems with this graft, they stented it, further problems, it's occluded. And you can see on these axial views, the black, no contrast in there, but the rim of the stent around it. Challenges when assessing grafts? Well, the surgical clips, uh, so the wires around the sternum can cause artifacts. So you have to be aware of these beam hardening, these streak artifacts, and that that's not uh, causing a pseudostenosis. Similarly, the clips, if they're very close to the artery and very dense, they can also cause pseudostenosis. So you can have um, some challenges when assessing grafts. Okay, so let's move on to how to summarize all this information because we've got a lot of information from these CT scans. When a uh, um, Kermi angiogram shows normal blood vessels, then everything's quite easy and the report's quite short. Normal coronary arteries, normal cardiac valves and chambers, no significant non cardiac findings, end of report. Um, however, the more disease we have, with listing in the body of our report, the more complicated that is for the clinicians to understand and action. So that's where CADRADS comes in. So CADRADS is a way of summarizing our CT uh, findings and communicating that with clinicians. Now, one thing, one sort of word of warning is that CADRADS only looks at the most severe stenosis. So we do have to be aware that sometimes there's three vessel disease with lots of other stuff going on, but we're only describing in CADRADS the most severe stenosis. And depending on the patient and the clinical situation, that may or may not be the most useful or the right thing to do. That's about interpreting CADRADS. Applying CADRADS is not difficult. And um, so we, you can see here, we've got um, five different categories, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then four is split into two bits. So zero, no plaque. One, our most severe stenosis is mild. Two, our most severe stenosis, it, sorry, one, minimal, two, mild, three, moderate, 50 to 70%. CADRADS 4A is a 70 to 99% stenosis or left main stenosis above 50% or three vessel obstructive disease. And then CADRADS 5 occluded. Now there are two different um, CADRADS uh, tables that you'll see in uh, this paper here. One is for stable chest pain and the other is for patients with acute chest pain. Now you'll notice that the degree of maximal stenosis is the same, it's just the interpretation and recommendations for management that are slightly different. And um, a lot of people around the world use CADRADS from the point of view of describing the stenoses. In different countries, people use the interpretation and management differently. And as um, uh, management recommendations change, this will be revised and updated and things. So, um, the next thing when it comes to CADRADS is the modifiers. So we've got a few extra things we can say in addition to the number. The first is non-diagnostic, and you want to be careful not to use that too often. The second thing is, is there a stent? Third, is there a graft? And finally, vulnerable plaque. And we're looking at two or more high-risk features like we talked about before. So this is an example of CADRADS 0, normal coronary arteries. CADRADS 1, just one um, plaque there that it assesses, and that's mild. CADRADS 4A, a severe stenosis in that LED. And then CADRADS 2V, the use of the vulnerable plaque here to identify that positive remodeling and spotty calcification. So a few tips for reporting. First, 
always look at the coronary arteries in at least two ways. So that might be looking at your axial images and then looking at your curved planar reformation, or maybe you're looking at the NPR in some way. Whatever you do, look at it at least two ways, and the 3D reconstruction does not count for this. So ideally, axial view and curved planar reformation. When you're looking at your curved planar reformation, be sure that your center lines are where you think your center lines are. It can be very easy to think that it's the LED and actually it's gone down the diagonal because that's bigger and the LED is occluded. You don't want to miss something like that. And the curved planar reformations can uh, introduce some errors, particularly if they're manually drawn. So you do have to be careful with that. The next thing is uh, using MIP can help you work out where small branches are going, but don't use that for calcified plant because it makes the blooming artifact of calcification worse. And you don't want to use a MIP for looking at stenosis because that can overestimate the degree of stenosis. If you're trying to work out how bad a stenosis is, looking at the proximal and the distal segments can help. And remember calcified plaque often you're overestimating, so be careful with them. If you're struggling, compare one phase with different phases. You want to always look at more than one reconstruction if you're not sure of what's going on, and be careful of post-processing problems that can appear. So things we've covered, how to identify and report coronary artery disease, how to be able to identify coronary artery stents and how that can influence your CT scan, and identifying and reporting coronary artery bypass grafts. And I'd be happy to answer any questions.